You're listening to the Cricket Collective on TalkSport 2. I'm Neil Manthorpe and today I'm joined by the former England fast bowler Steve Harmison as we build up to the second test between India and England which starts in the early hours of Saturday morning. Over the next hour there's a lot to talk about. We'll look at England's 12-man squad, discuss who should be left out of the final uh, 11 and ask why Jimmy Anderson isn't included. And we'll also be joined by the former England wicketkeeper Matt Pryor, who's also joining us on the commentary team for the second test. Plenty to get stuck into. You're listening to the Cricket Collective on Talksport 2. But before we speak to Harmy, let's hear from the England captain in his pre match captain's press conference, Joe Root. Joe, this was always going to be a, a really tough challenge for England. Does this now, in a way, become even more tough with India being 1-0 down. We saw how well they bounced back in Australia. Does this second test provide you guys with an even sterner challenge? It certainly provides us a stern challenge, but it's not going to be, it's not as tough as if we were 1-0 down. Um, that is for sure. We're sitting in a really good position. We played brilliant cricket. We'll take a lot of confidence forward into this week, um, but we won't get ahead of ourselves. Um, I think we're very understanding of how much hard work it's going to take to win in these conditions. We've seen that firsthand in the last week. Played, had to play a pretty much perfect game um, that time round. So we, we know what it's going to require for us to win. Um, but that challenge excites the group. Um, we, we know the game plan and, and what it, you know, as I mentioned, what it takes to, to set things up and all the hard work that goes into it. And that all has to start again. And we can't take anything from last week in terms of the performances. It's, it's a blank canvas uh, and that, that hard work has to start from ball one, whatever it is that we, we end up doing. Um, but, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an exciting group of players full of confidence and you know, we, we definitely need to make the most of that going into the week. And do the players have an extra spring in their step, Joe, with um, fans being back in now over the next couple of weeks? Is that, are you firstly happy with all the procedures in place and how excited are you and the players for that? Yeah, I think they, when you're living in these bubble environments, um, there's there's huge amounts of protocols and procedures that are there to look after everyone in the ground and, you know, obviously the players and people within the the bubbles. but the atmosphere within the ground is something that you know, test, test match cricket's been missing. So to have that back is going to be great. All of the players thrive off it. Having that atmosphere um, to build up those big moments within the test will be, will be fantastic. And you, you come to a place like India, so passionate about sport. Um, that, that's a side, of, a side of the game that you really looked forward to as a player. Um, and it'd be great to see the ground hopefully nearly half full this week and beyond. That was Joe Root speaking to Talk Sports' Sam Ellard. Okay, Harmy, uh, that's the England captain. Um, first, first things first. I think it's we know that we're in in unprecedented times, but England have just had one of the great Test wins. They win by two hundred and twenty-seven runs, and they make four changes for the next Test match. Three of which were unenforced. Obviously, Jofra Archer's injured. But it's um, it, it, I'm not judging. I'm not. I'm all I'm saying is it's very, very unusual to the point that it's unprecedented. Yeah, I, I agree, Manners, and uh, I don't know what to make of it. If I'm brutally honest, um, I've been thinking about it quite a bit, and it's uh, are we getting are we getting to the point a bit like football, and we're trying to reinvent the wheel and you know, having so many changes. If we're playing for England, it's international sports. It's in, you know, you're at the value of the test shirt. Things starting to come in question. Um, what are we resting players for? Um, I understand the, the the world we live in, the COVID world we live in, but we're resting players and leaving them out there. Uh, if you're going to rest in players, you, you do what you did with Bairstow and Wood and Curran, Butler now sending them home. If I was Jimmy Anderson, I'd be. I wouldn't be very happy. I'd be spitting feathers. I'd be saying, "Well, I, I, I missed the first test in Sri Lanka. Played the second test. Got six wickets." played the first test here we've won why am I not playing in the second test match and uh, for somebody who's played 150 odd test matches I think it would be difficult for Broad and Anderson to go through this because they've gone through a full circle of being of what cricket used to be like and to where to where it's going now and I don't have an issue with the a little bit of rest and rotation policy I, I, I have an issue with what they're rest and rotating for 
and that is something that I can't get my head around because the rest of them trying to keep people fresh for one day competitions or white ball competitions and that for me just doesn't make sense especially in an Ashes calendar year yeah Harmy when you pl- when you were playing you presumably accepted that injuries were part of the game they were going to be part of your career and so you knew that there would be times when you were sitting it out sometimes for a short time sometimes for a long time because you were you were inj- injured in the natural course of of doing your job so that's frustrating enough it's a whole different ball game when you're sitting it out and you're fit and in form and you've just bowled <laughs> one of the great overs of all time yeah, and it, it does. It just, it just. Uh, that's why I think if I was Jimmy, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make a great deal of sense. I'd be wanting to play, to play all the time because I'm out there. It's not as though they're going to be, be. He's, he's got a chance to have a week on a beach and you know put his boots up. He's going to be running drinks, doing twelfth man, doing his training beforehand, doing his training during, bowling in the nets. It's arguably harder. You know, from a mental point of view, to get yourself going, when you're not playing, then it actually is just doing what the routine tells you, and you go out and play. And that for me is where I struggle. I I didn't like. I I was very much. I was devastated when I wasn't playing playing cricket. So it's it just seems to be the way this this world's going. You talk about being judged and how things are going. Well, if you look at the last Test match, there was a lot of talk about the declaration with Joe Root, and we said on I thought we've called it brilliantly on Talksport too, where we let's trust what Joe Root. He's been on the pitch for a lot of that pitch for long. He knows what's going on, and he'd be judged. The most important thing, he'd be judged on how the outcome is at the end of it and he won so it was it was a positive it was a positive um vibe that that went through that that decision this is going to be judged on how it goes because if england lose this test match there'd be a lot of question marks on butler going home and anderson not playing and you know we're we're, we're leaving bess out who got four wickets um so it'll be judged on that but let's wait and see let's see how the test match you know players out yeah and um and i think if there if there is criticism to to come from it if they do lose then i think possibly some of it might be justified i think um that ed smith and and chris silverwood made the policy very very clear and i got the impression they were never going to deviate from it even when when archer was uh, injured um that it just it didn't change their their stated policy pre-tour that uh, Broad and Anderson would be rotated. Fast forward 10 or 15 or 20 years or however far you like, what do you think uh, people will say when they look back at uh, two of the greatest fast bowlers of all time and they say, do you realise that for the last four years of their career they never played in the same Test match side? Yeah, I think it'll be bizarre and I think what you'll find is in the, ne- in the next 10, 15, 20 years, like you say, when you look at their numbers, people will go, wow, they played how many test matches? <laughs> how many test matches? Because if you go, if if this cycle does keep going and you do keep getting rotated, instead of, you know, instead of playing 12, 14 test matches a year, you're only playing six or seven. To get to somewhere near the numbers that Broad and Anderson have got, or even as a batsman getting to them numbers, would take you some time. So I think the game seems it seems to be going this way. It seems to be want to change. I think you can only do this if you're fortunate enough to have a big pool of players that are good enough, which England have have got. Um, and like I said a couple of weeks ago, when we were talking about the rotation policy, I, I don't mind it if it's done for the right reasons and it's done for the right reasons because of COVID and keeping people's sanity and minds fresh and, you know, protecting them from the bubble. I get that. But when you're sending people home to protect them for a white ball 2020 competition, I think personally that that's wrong, especially in a year when the ashes are coming up. Mm. I don't believe Joe Root is going to get his best 11 until possibly Brisbane. And I think if that's the case, then I, I think England might struggle because the dynamics of having your best team and your captain and overseeing everything is, for me, is, is huge in getting the continuity with not only selection, but bowling changes and who bowls well with who and the way things are going and people getting left out and being prepared for T20 competitions. Uh, it doesn't sit very well ha- with me from ha- that. Harmy, I, I need to 
organised for you and Owen Morgan to sit in a room together and us to record the conversation between the two of you. Yeah, well, it's not. It's it's <laughs> Owen Morgan. It's it's. If I, I'd be if I was Joe Root, I'd be I'd be having this conversation with my superiors and say, hold on, you know, two years ago we set a blue a plan and a roadmap to win the 2019 World Cup. You know, we 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 took the hit. We rested players. We give Owen Morgan everything in his you know in his powers to get the best of his 15-man squad to win the World Cup, and we won it. Brilliant, fantastic. Why can't we do that for the Ashes? Why can't I have the team that I'm going to have in Brisbane for the majority of this year, and we focus solely on getting our bowling right? and our batting combinations right. Why can't we do that? That's the question I'd be asking my superiors if I was Joe Root. More in a moment. You're listening to the Cricket Collective on TalkSport 2 as we continue the build-up to the second test between India and England in Chennai beginning on Saturday morning. Next up, we'll discuss more bowling dilemmas and ask why Jimmy Anson uh, isn't playing in the second test. But also, uh, who should play out of Chris Wokes or Ollie Stone? A little bit of this and a little bit of that, I would think. And there it is! Oh, Jimmy Anderson! Yeah! Yeah! You're listening to the Cricket Collective on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and the former England fast bowler, Steve Harmison. Don't forget, TalkSport 2 is the place to hear live and exclusive ball-by-ball commentary of the second test and the third and the fourth between India and England in Chennai. Our coverage begins at 3.45. Before we get into uh, more bowling debates with, uh, with Harmy, let's hear from England coach Chris Silverwood who says there's no reason why Jimmy can't play well into his 40s if he stays fit. Listen, that's Jimmy's choice. Uh, He is in the best shape of his life. Uh, And as I've said to him, it hasn't gone unnoticed that. I mean, he's worked extremely hard in his fitness uh, and he's in great shape and he's bowling beautifully. Uh, So I think the rest of it really, as long as he's fit and he's strong and he's healthy and he wants to play, then... It throws his heart in the ring, doesn't it? All right, we've done a lot, Harmy, on uh, on Stuart Broad and, and Jimmy Anderson. Let's just talk about um, Joffre Archer, how much of a loss he is, and who takes his place, Chris Wokes or Ollie Stone? I suppose Stone is more like for like. Wokes, uh, inevitably people will say, yeah, but you get a genuine all-rounder. But you want, I think, I think wickets from him will be more important than runs, and they've cost him eighty in his three Test matches in India so far. Yeah, and I think I think you talk about what's happened before, but every time you go somewhere new, you're more experienced, you've learnt. Hopefully, you've learnt a lot by playing international cricket. And I'd like to think Chris Wokes is a better bowler for for the experience he's had. If it is Wokes that plays, I think it's a huge blow for for England lose an archer he for me he set the tone when he got Rohit Sharma out and that spelly bowl very first up on on in the first innings of India's first innings when they were batting um, and it, it is a, a big blow I think England will be looking at the surface and thinking if there is any sort of pierce in the wicket bounce in the wicket because there was a little bit on that first morning um, that might go stone but being one nil up, if England win the toss and you've got Chris Wokes coming in at number nine and Stuart Broad's not going to get his head knocked off so he, he can bat at number 10, all of a sudden, you know, England, probably the, the depth of their batting unit is a, is a is a big thing and I still think Wokes is a better player than what, a better bowler than what he was the last time he was in India. So I think England might go down the, the, the cautious route and go Wokes and Broad, completely pack their batting and say we're well, one nil up in the series. We will get. We win the toss. We can get a big score, and we can affect the game that way. Um, harsh on Ollie Stone, but uh, I'm really pleased to see Mo and Ali back in the team because I think England needed to find a way to get him in, just to give him some cricket to sort of get his mojo back. Because <sighs> is he the Mo and Ali from five year ago? No, but. We don't know what's what's sort of going on inside Moen's head until we've actually seen how he performs. So it'll be interesting to see how he goes. I'm delighted that he's back, Blen. Tom Bess. I think this decision required a real deep dig uh, or, or dip into the honesty well, didn't it? Because 
I mean, the, the man's got 17 wickets at 22 mm. in three test matches. Um, are those figures a fair reflection of, of how he's bowled? The numbers are terrific. And, you know, we spend all our lives saying, well, that's why we have numbers. That's why we go by st- statistics. Just have a look at the numbers, you know, 17 wickets at 22. But are they a fair reflection of how he's bowled? Yeah, because it because he got the wickets. He got for a Coley caught back pad. Wow. Wow. This is the, one of the greats of the game. He's bowled wicket taking balls. Uh, is it harsh on Dom Best? Possibly, I think it it is. Um, if they're trying to, you know, I thought if we're going to get Mo and Ali in, we might have got him in as a third spinner, and which took which would take pressure off Dom Best. But England have gone down this road and it'll be interesting to see how Don Best comes back from it. They left out Don Best and played Jack Leach, who got totally took to the cleaners by Rishi Pant in the, in the, um, in the first innings. And you were worrying, this could, be a long, this could be a long winter now for, for Jack Leach. And he uh, responded well, came back, got Rowett Sharma and, and never looked back, four wickets in the second inning. So it's going to be interesting to see how Don Best recovers from this. I personally think he's done a great job, even though in between times, you know, he would like to sort of polish up on, on, on some of the deliveries that he's bowled. But by and large, we talk about England's perfect performance in that first test match. There were some individuals who will think they could do better. Um, and Don Bess is definitely one of them. But when you look at the winter he's had so far, the numbers you've mentioned aren't bad for somebody, well, for two spinners who were supposed to come to the subcontinent who weren't as highly regarded as, as, as what we've had in the past. Just quickly, um, sometimes this term can be regarded as, as sarcastic and I don't mean it to be at all because you have luxury bowlers uh, in a team. Ben Stokes has turned himself into such a good batsman that England are now building a bowling attack without, it seems, major consideration of him. So is, is that it? Will, they, will he never be part of the major construction of a bowling attack again? Will he, is, he, is he now the... The, the luxury bowler who, you know, he, he takes a wicket uh, whenever you need him to and he still does the business. But do, do, you, do you know what I mean? Is it- yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I, can, I fully understand what you mean. I think uh, I can feel that because I was that bowler. I, I was that bowler sometimes for England. when But we had the luxury of having Andrew Flintoff. So you'd uh, on a consistent basis, consistent basis, Freddie was more consistent than what I was and maybe Simon was, but the luxury bowler in that five-man Ashes attack, 05, you had Simon and myself with Pierce, who potentially could be erratic and could be, but also could win matches for you. And I think that's what that's what Ben Stokes gives you. I think ideally, if I was captain of England, I wouldn't want Ben Stokes to, to bowl too much because of the, the how he bats. But we seen in, like we've seen Manners in Cape Town and like we've seen many times at Headingley, when the back's against the wall, nine times out of ten, who does Joe Root throw the ball to when he needs something to happen? It's Ben Stokes. And if you can use him that way, sparingly, but effectively, then I think it's fantastic for the team because it, it, it protects his pattern. So I don't think Ben Stokes is, is, is finished as a bowler just yet. I think there's still a lot to come for Ben. Well, you would hope so. I mean... Um... You compare him to to other genuine all rounders, of which there have been very few around the world in in recent years, and very very few. Even Callis uh, became less and less of a of a of a front line bowler, and, and I guess it's just a natural progression for Ben because, it is. as I said, he's such a damn good batsman. But the thing with Jack, the thing with Jack Callis was sometimes Graham Smith would chuck him to chuck him the ball and say, right, bowl to a seven two field to dry things up for six or seven overs because he could trust him to do a job. I think Ben is the opposite way. I think when things aren't happening and you need a crowd left and you are sensing that, that something needs to happen, I think Ben was a bit more like a, a Flintoff or a, a both a mesk where sometimes, you know, you listen to Michael Vaughan talk about how he used Freddie. He would say, you know, things might not be happening. Things might be meandering along or going stale and quiet. I'd, he'd throw Freddie that just said, Andrew, just bowl me two overs just to get the crowd going. That's what you do with Ben Stokes. So it, it, different all-rounders are, are, are built in a different way. And I, and I still think when England really needs something to happen in a game, the ten, it, Joe will tend to go to Ben Stokes because that's what he does. He gets everybody lifted. 
I'm just going to um, go off on a tangent slightly here. This uh, England team, this squad, seems to me to be deeply respected. They're a very, very likeable team. Um, I think uh, Joe Root's an immensely respected captain and also at the same time very personable and very likeable. Um, England in the past might have been a bit prickly, a bit susceptible to criticism, and they're not alone um, in that in any regard. It was interesting to hear what Ollie Pope said, for example, about uh, the criticism that they were aware of uh, at the end of the fourth day about not declaring. So let's hear what Ollie Pope has to say. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Everyone's different. Some people will read it, others won't. I, I was sort of flicking through Twitter and at the end of day four and it was I was pretty amazed with what I saw to be honest we, we had dominated four days of cricket and we're sort of getting felt like we were getting slated a little bit so we just use that as an extra bit of motivation not that we needed any more to to go out there and win that final day but um we trust trust the decisions of the skipper and we we chat a lot as a group and um I think the right decisions were made and we were able to go and execute them at the, on that day five and win with a lot of time to spare. That was Ollie Pope, uh, who was um, apparently, along with uh, some of his teammates, um, aghast at, uh, at the criticism. Um, first of all, Army, I mean, should they be looking at it? Should they be, give a proverbial about what people are saying on yeah. Twitter? Uh, that personally, obviously, man, as we lived in the we lived in the great world and the great times, didn't we? When black <laughs> and white TV and <laughs> We only had three channels on our telly, but that, the world's changed now. The first thing the guys come off the off the pitch, as soon as they're allowed, the phones check on their phones and go through through social media to say what people say of them. And they're not alone. Footballers do the same, and so probably will rugby players. But well, I listen to to Ollie. He's got a point. He's he's right. Um, but unfortunately, Ollie, this is the world you live in, and um, people get paid for their opinions, and whether they're right or wrong. It doesn't really matter as long as the team are doing what needs to be done, and the, the team did a, a brilliant job. Um, I thought we covered it. I thought we covered it excellent on Talksport too because we we didn't criticise the actual declaration. I think we talked about the numbers that England needed. It was just a little bit for 20 minutes. The game stood still a little bit, and you were, we were wondering, well, why is it happening like this? Um, England won the game, like I said earlier. Joe Root and England selectors will be judged, coaching staff will be judged on on the outcome. The outcome worked perfectly for Joe Root in that declaration point of view. And let's see what the outcome comes of this test selection of you know, four changes in three unforced changes uh, going into the next test match by the end of it. Personally, Hami, I thought uh, if if England supporters were getting frustrated... Imagine how frustrating it was for the Indian team and for Indian supporters. Absolutely. So, I mean, if the game was if the game was meandering along, going nowhere, and England had enough runs, imagine how frustrating it was for the Indian team. I Absolutely, mean, we're looking at Virat Kohli four Test matches in a row. He's lost now. Pressure that's coming. We've seen pictures of, of of what potential crowd could could be in the stadium for this this um, this second Ahmed about. I mean, this second Chennai Test. Can you imagine if England win the toss and mm. them 15,000 straight away will be <laughs> on the back foot? So will the India, India captain. Can you imagine what his thoughts are waiting to do his talk to the, the, the media when uh, when while Joe Root's speaking, saying we're going to have a bat first. We've made four changes. The pitch looks good. <laughs> We'd look to get first innings runs on the board. Uh, over to you, Virat. <laughs> That's exactly what I'd be saying if I was Joe Root. <laughs> You're listening to the Cricket Collective on Talksport 2 with uh, me, Neil Manthorpe, and Double Ashes winner Steve Harmison. Still to come, we'll look at what India needs to do to bounce back. And we're also joined by former England wicketkeeper and a returnee to our commentary team, Matt. My name is Rul Dahl. Some of you may know my books. Come on, Daddy. But this is only the beginning of our story. Back to us, I am trying. The true story of Roald Dahl and Patricia Neal. One gobstopper, please. Starring Hugh Bonneville. Do you like it? And Keely Halls. I love it. I think she would have liked it as well. A Sky Original to Olivia. 19th of February, only on Sky Cinema, the home of Sky Original Films. The census builds a picture of our community. When you fill in yours, you help make decisions about things that matter to you. Like our local hospitals. Better transport connections. School places. Census Day is the 21st of March. 
Look out for more information in the post or visit census.gov.uk. Census 2021. It's about us. Delivered by the Office for National Statistics. Prior. Yeah, it goes on the onside. They take one. Is it going to go all the way? It just gets to the advertising rope at the far end. And Ben Folks has a hundred on debut. You're listening to the Cricket Collective on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and former England fast bowler Steve Harmison as we continue to look ahead to the second test between India and England in Chennai on Saturday morning. If you've missed any of the show so far or you wish to catch up, you can download the following on feed available on Apple Podcasts, Acast and Spotify. But it's time now to discuss Ben Folks as he prepares to play his first test match in two years. And joining us now to help us on the topic is uh, former England wicketkeeper Matt Pryor. But let's first hear from England head coach Chris Silverwood, who believes that the side won't necessarily be weakened because of the change of wicketkeepers. I don't see it as, as weakening. Uh, I see it as an opportunity for people to come in and show us what they can do as well, because last time he was in the subcontinent, he was very successful. Uh, so I'm looking forward to watching him come in and I mean, looking forward to watching him play. That was Chris Silverwood talking about the return of Ben Folks to uh, the Test Eleven. Um, well, first of all, uh, welcome back, Matt. We're looking forward to uh, having you back on the, the commentary team and the, the coffee is hot and strong. <laughs> I hope it's strong. Thank you, Manners. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on Joss Butler going home? I mean, to be fair, he's got a young family and, and he um, appears to be entirely uh, receptive to, to the idea, unlike some others who are still uh, a bit prickly with the rotation um, policy. But, um, but Butler seems to be quite, quite happy. Um, and, and folks is a, is a terrific glove man. Uh, yes, uh, you know... Folks is a ter- terrific love man, and we can get we can get onto that. I think first, the first, first and foremost, with Butler going home, there, the life of an England cricketer or international cricketer has been spoken about a huge amount. Um, people will see when they're playing the games, they will see the Test matches as lords, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the amount of time away from home is incredible, and someone like Butler who plays all three forms, it's even more so. I mean, I remember. My, my last year as an international cricketer, which was, what, five years ago, whatever it was, six years ago, it was, I spent 290 days away from home. And I was only playing test cricket at that time. So it shows you the amount of time these guys are away. That's all, re- you know, mental health, all of these uh, factors come into play. Then throw COVID, bubbles, not being able to leave the hotel. You're going literally hotel room to the ground. And back again. I mean, all we see England cricketers tweeting and posting about is them playing PlayStation and computer games. I mean, it, it, that is going in itself is another huge aspect to, to throw into the mix. So where do I stand on this? I think you have to look after these players. You have to look at, you know, not just the physical side of things, but the mental side of things. Zoom calls and, and WhatsApp videos and everything are all well and good. But when you've got a young family, it puts a lot of strain on a player. And England want Joss Butler fit, fresh, mentally and physically for as long as possible. So, you know, I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a good call. Um, and, and I, you know, I've, I, I'm, I'm behind the fact that he, he is going home. Now, what you can't say is England aren't weakened, and that's not having a go at Ben Folks, but you are losing a world-renowned international class player who's won games of cricket for England with the bat. And whenever Joss Butler walks out to bat, you think whatever position England are in, you think he could win it for them. You know, you go back to last year, Pakistan, Pakistan game, um, where he turned it around under a huge amount of pressure, people calling for his head and saying he shouldn't be playing. Um, so, you know, that, that aspect can't be ignored. He is a fine, fine cricketer, a match-winning cricketer. However, as we say, in steps Ben Folks. Now, this guy, we, we first watched him in international cricket in Sri Lanka, walks in to bat five down, not many on the board, and scores 100. Everyone has been speaking about his wicket keeping. Everyone knows what a fantastic, you know, he's the best gloveman in the country. There's, I think there's no doubt about that. Um, but not many people spoke about his batting. And he came out and he, and he scored 100 um, on debut in really tough conditions. So it's not necessarily that this, the team is weakened. It's, it's just going to be different. Butler is an international superstar. 
But in comes this young guy who is obviously hugely ambitious and, of course, has the talent and ability. So it's actually quite an exciting change. Matty, I look at the this so far, and I, if I was Joe Root, I'd be going, like I, I mentioned earlier in the show, Owen Morgan gets what he wants to get the best to win a World Cup in 2019, and rightly so, they went and won it. Best team, fantastic. In, a, in an Ashes year, an Ashes calendar year, I've got 17 test matches, and I'm and as Joe Root, England captain, I might not get my side to win the Ashes or potentially go and win the Ashes until I get to Brisbane. I don't think that's fair. That's one point I make. The second point I make, I sometimes, and I, I don't know about you, I sometimes feel as I start digging a hole when I'm talking about Ben Folks because I feel as though he's our third best option. When I look at it, you say it's not weakening the side, but I look at Josh Butler. Josh Butler's got 250 test matches, and he's number one. I think J- Johnny Bairstow is another one that gets rested for T20 competitions, who is, for me, a better option when it comes to the whole package. And I find myself criticising and criticising, and I find that it comes on Ben Folks, and I don't think that's fair because the kid's not done anything wrong, but I still believe that England's best options are Butler and Besto. Where do you stand on that? Uh, mate, I don't, listen, I can't, I, I can't disagree with that. I think that's, that is another argument. Now, mm. whether players should be mi- missing test matches or one day as or 2020s, now that, that's a whole now, mate, you and I, we focus test cricket, and for me, test cricket is still the pinnacle. The, yeah. Winning the Ashes is the pinnacle. And Ashes year, that would be your sole focus, absolutely. I think... I'm just trying to play devil's advocate. 17 test matches, a lot of test cricket. Um, the conditions that you're playing, you find yourself in India are not anything like the conditions you find yourself playing in Australia. It's still, in sports terms, quite a long way away. I mean, we know how much can change in a week, in a day, let alone a, a month or two. Um, so from that perspective, I, I kind of think, OK, well, maybe that's why they've made the call to, to leave, let Joss miss the test matches um, rather than the 2020s. If you're Joe Root, may again agree, you want your best 11. I mean, we were having a conversation yesterday about, okay, what should the team be? And and I will always stick by the team that walks out on any given day of test cricket should be the 11 that you believe can win the test match. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't go far, far away from that. But there are so many other factors now. Now, we also don't know the influence of, you mentioned it, IPL. You know, the players want to play in the IPL. We know how lucrative it is. The world has changed since since we played because when we played, it was Test Cricket for England was the absolute pinnacle and that was the number one thing that we wanted to focus on. And the ECB have a quite a tricky... Um, they're in a, in a tricky position of having to try and balance which games the players play, how they make them available, because, you know, you cannot stop players playing the IPL now. And nor should you, nor, no. nor should you want to. Absolutely. Um, you know... And, and that's where I, I wonder, and we will never know this sort of hypothesis, I wonder how much Joss has had a say in what I think I saw Ed Smith saying that, you know, he spoke, Joss has been involved. He's, he's been involved in the conversation. And I wonder if they've said, right, these are the easier options. You can either play all the tests in India or go home from India and have the rest then. And then Mr. Twin, you know, how much, where does Joss put the value of test cricket? I think he would put it very high. I'm not saying for one minute that he's the one that said, I don't want to play test cricket. Let's not go down that route at all. But you've got to miss, you've got to give something up. And, and you know, it's it's a headache, certainly. Yeah, I, I just feel as though the way T20 is evolving now, the franchises, as a cricketer, you pop in four or five days, sometimes even less before the, the tournament. You play the game and you go out. This is the England team, I, I, and I don't understand why. And if we're going to start resting people for white ball competitions, there's a white, there's a world tournament every year for the next three years. So again, comes back to the question, and you more or less said it right at the very start. And the answer that Test match cricket is the pinnacle. Are we now devaluing the Test Test match cricket shirt? Because if you do well in it, doesn't automatically get you a game the following week. And, I, and again, Matt, I, think, I imagine we all speak about this over the, over the coming week. Um, where does Test cricket stand in a player's mind? You know, yeah. Is it still the pinnacle? Is it still, uh, you know, Ashes Ashes hundred at Lords? Is that still the number one thing, or is it a hundred off thirty balls in the IPL final for the Mumbai Indians? You know, where 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 do players' values truly lie now? Um, because like, everyone everyone speaks about Test cricket 
uh, and says, you know, we've got to look after Test cricket because of the, the fans, the supporters, the spectators. We have to get people watching. For a long time now, I've said, if you don't have the players playing, you're going to struggle. Don't worry about the fans and the spectators and the supporters just yet. We have to make sure that Test cricket is still the pinnacle and the best players in the world, whether they're England, Australia, India, West Indies, Pakistan, want to be playing Test cricket. You know, there's a lot of money being thrown at short-form cricket, 2020 franchise cricket. And ultimately, you know, and guys will make decisions based on, oh, well, hold on a minute. I know I can go and, as you said, Hami, I'll dip into this franchise for four weeks. I'll make my 200 grand or whatever it is. Playing five days of test cricket in India for 10 grand or whatever. I don't know what the fees are these days. I'm sure it's a lot more than that right now there's suddenly a question mark of actually, hold on, there's a big, big price over here that I can take. Does that actually suit me better, suit my family better? Because actually I go out there for four weeks, I then come home for a couple of weeks, I spend more time. Do you know what I mean? All these things start adding up and suddenly test cricket for a player, let alone fans, for a player, test cricket suddenly goes down the list of in the pecking order of which form of the game you want to play. And somebody who you know very well because you've, you've spent a lot of time in the middle with him, you've kept with him, and I'm over the moon to see him back and I'm interested to see how he goes. How pleasing is it to see Mo and Ali back? Because Dom Sibley's, Dom, sorry, Dom Bess's numbers stack up. Me and Manners was talking about earlier. He's got wickets you know, that you'd like to sort of polish up on a few things, but um, how pleased is it to see Mo and Ali back in an England test shirt? Um, personally, I'm delighted. For, for me, Mo and Ali is England's best spinner. In, in Test cricket, I, I think he's he's won games for England. He's taken wickets. Um, he's you know, then went out of favour. I think he was handled poorly, to be to be frank. And you know how you can sort of take someone's Red Bull contract away and then stop them from going and playing franchise cricket, and IPL cricket. I, I don't see how that works, and that's just going to put put his back up. I'll, I'll go as far as to say, if Mo and Ali hadn't played in this Test match. I, I'd, or if he hadn't played this Test series, I'm not sure he would come back to Test cricket again. I think we would have lost him to the England cricket team. So I'm absolutely de- delighted for Moen, but also for for the England team, for Test cricket, for, for England fans, that he is he is playing now. Obviously, he has to go out and execute, and he has to he has to bowl the way and and bat as well. Let's not forget his batting. He's a phenomenal batsman. He's had you know some poor form, but he's a phenomenal batsman. If Moen Ali at his best comes into this team, is, for me, England's best option as a spinner. He's England's number one spinner, and what he offers with a bat as well is yeah, can be crucial. Matt Pryor, many thanks. He'll be part of our commentary team for the second test, and you can hear live and exclusive ball-by-ball commentary here on TalkSport 2. We're on air from 3.45am on Saturday morning. Here comes... Um... Oh, well, bold. Yes, yes, really well bold. A little nick from Jasprit Bruma, and the Test match is over. England win. You're listening to the Cricket Collective on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and the former England fast bowler, Steve Harmison. Don't forget, TalkSport 2 is the place to hear live and exclusive ball-by-ball commentary of the second Test between India and England in Chennai. And our coverage begins at 3.45am on Saturday morning. But in the final part of the show, we'll assess what India need to do to respond. But first, let's hear from their captain, Virat Kohli, in particular, the decision not to pick left-arm wrist spinner, Kuldeep Yadav. When you're playing two off-spinners, Kuldeep more or less becomes a similar kind of spinner taking the ball away. So you need variety in the bowling attack. Uh, We were quite clear on what we wanted to play, what combination we wanted to play. And uh, there are no regrets whatsoever on that decision. And uh, moving forward, uh, we will think of combinations which brings us variety uh, as a bowling attack and not, not one-dimensional where the ball is only turning away from the bat. So these things are very important to understand. I'm delighted to say joining us on the line from India now is uh, Indian broadcaster and right in Chetanya Rulo. Um, yeah. It was interesting to hear Virat there likening Kuldeep to a, an off-spinner. <laughs> um, he's a bit more than that. I mean, if you can turn the ball both ways, uh, surely... Yeah, well, I shouldn't say surely. Let me just ask you, is is he an option? Do you think he will play in the second test? Um, doubtful, Neil. Very doubtful because uh, Akshar Patel has been declared fit and available for the second test and he was the first choice for uh, the first test. And 
I don't really know what Kuldeep Yadav needs to do to get back into the test lineup. I mean, he picked up a five for in his last overseas test in 2018, and Ravi Shastri declared to the whole world that he will be their number one spin option going forward. And he's played two test matches since then in the last two years. So he can take the ball away and bring it back into the right hander. That's what wrist spinners do, don't they? And he's an unorthodox left arm wrist spinner, which is which is quite a bit of rarity in cricket. I don't think playing Shabazz Nadim was the best decision. Of course, that's uh, added hindsight. But Shabazz Nadim is primarily a long-format bowler. India's domestic long-format tournament, Ranji Trophy, hasn't happened. Akshar Patel has played white ball domestic cricket. Kuldeep Yadav has been part of international white ball domestic cricket, been part of the red ball squad in Australia. He's been He's been in the mix. You can't... You can't take both of those bowlers out of the equation and say, OK, we'll play somebody else who was just a net bowler for you. And that ended up costing the test match to India. Jane, do you think India underestimated England? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough one, Steve. I mean, if you look at the scoreboard, you think they probably did. I'm not sure that's an entirely true statement, but look at the first innings of India, you know. They didn't underestimate England overall, but what they probably thought was, if England can score 550 on this pitch, we can score that too. And that's what some of their dismissals in the first innings show. Some of them are very lackadaisical dismissals. I mean, if you look at what how Rahane got out to a full toss. Excellent catch by Joe Root, but it was a full toss. Look at Shubman Gill's shot. Look at uh, Rohit Sharma. He got an excellent delivery, but he's not been the best of forms. And... He's not scoring too many runs and he's not in the right frame of mind. He's dropping catches and celebrating and gesticulating uh, when he's getting out, uh, playing attacking strokes. He's saying that's my natural game. It doesn't work like that in test cricket. So I think India thought that they could easily score 500 odd runs on that pitch. It turned out to be a lot tougher and that's where they lost the test match. How much of a loss is, has um, Jadeja been, Ravi Jadeja? And, and also, and also, Chets, let's not forget that um, India lost the first test in Australia, came back with the series in their uh, kit bag. Oh, absolutely. I mean, turnarounds are always possible. And if India can turn this one around, that'll be magical as well. But yes, Jadeja is a massive, massive loss. It's not just about uh, what Jadeja himself brings to the table in terms of his fielding, his bowling and batting. But Shahbaz Nadim went for 233 runs in two innings. Jareja wouldn't have done that, not to mention the partnership that he brings with Ashwin. If you have Jareja bowling tight from one end and taking his own wickets, that puts added pressure on the batsman and Ashwin can go to work from the other end. So Ashwin and Jareja bowling in tandem is a totally different prospect to Ashwin bowling in tandem with Sundar or Nadim. Because if we saw the first, if, if you look back at the first test match, uh, the pressure was relieved whenever Sundar and Nadim were batting. Uh, with Ishant and Bumrah and Ashwin, the pressure was there. There, were, there was an option to take wickets. But as soon as Sundar and Nadim came on to bowl, England were able to score runs freely. They gave away 300 runs out of those 555, 578 odds. So... Jareja would have kept it tight. Jareja would have picked wickets. Jareja would have fielded well. He would have scored runs. I think this series just goes to show how much um, India value Ravindra Jareja in Test cricket. And Jean, I think the million-dollar question is, from a journalist's point of view, um, we is not allowed being inside the ground and only the host broadcasters in. Are you journalists going to be standing in the queue for them 15,000 tickets to see if you can get in the ground? Because it's going to be interesting <laughs> to see what it's going to be like with uh, with with spectators back in the stadium oh that's that's going to be a, a novelty now isn't it with the fans coming back obviously there are strict pro- protocols to be followed i'm not sure they were followed when distributing the tickets but hopefully it'll be much stricter when the game gets underway but what i've been told is that local media can now get in and they will be sitting in the press boxes so the, the post match or the post days play press conferences will still happen virtually which is why i being in delhi haven't flown down to chennai just yet but the local media certainly will be in the press boxes to to cover the game. Manners, what do you, what do you make of the the crowd being allowed back in um, from a, a player safety point of view? Do you think the players will be from either side will be a bit cautious of of them they're living in a bubble and they're allowing other people into basically into that bubble? Is this the first way out of these biosecure bubbles? I'm terrified of uh, getting um, of getting into any serious 
debate about it um, because uh, I'm not a medical <laughs> expert. But, yeah. And yet, but but we've all, uh, you know, I mean, I've I've been inside a, a stadium with England with no crowds and in South Africa, uh, um, and I've done you know isolation. And I'm, I tell you what, I I will say, I'm I am absolutely perplexed. I won't say uh, horrified or I'm in disagreement. I am completely and totally. Perplexed. I'm sure that there are lots of protocols that have been put in place, but what happens when the ball is hit for six into the crowd, into those fifteen thousand people? I mean, are they are they are they being tested? Are they vetted? Are they are they? Um, do do you know, Chadden? I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah. I mean, you know, it's fifteen thousand people in in the stand, and um, you, you're going from such a tight biosecure environment, such an almost impregnable bubble to suddenly 15,000 people being right on the edge of it? Um, well, there will be protocols in place. What happens is they, they check uh, temperatures. Whenever, whenever uh, only once have I stepped to a restaurant in the last 10 months, and, and when I entered the restaurant, they took my temperature, and we have a, we have a domestic app called the Aroge Setu where you check, uh, you know, where it shows your status, if you've been in touch with infected people or not. I think those sort of checks are going to be in place where you're going to check the temperatures and everything. Uh, but even then, the decision is a bit debatable. Um, yes, India played in front of crowds in Australia, but Australia, you know, regulated their border controls very, very strictly. In India, uh, COVID has been rampant, but the number of cases has decreased so sharply Um in some part of some parts of the country, we've we've had only what ten or twenty. Like for example, in Delhi, we've had less than fifty daily cases for the past for for the past month, which which shows how it has significantly reduced. When you said that you know hitting the sixes in into that fifteen thousand crowd, what are they going to do then? Apparently, when the ball will be thrown back, there there will be uh, volunteers in the crowd, so they will take the ball from the crowd and they'll they'll throw it back or relay it back and before it gets to the umpire or it will be sanitized and the umpire will also sanitize it just it is just too much i mean it is just too much i understand the bcci wants to get the crowds back keeping in mind uh, the ipl perhaps in april which is going to happen in india or the t20 world cup later this year but maybe they could have waited till say the odis of the t20 legs um, of this tour to calculate the possibility of getting the crowds back. For me, it's still an early decision, but uh, let's wait and watch how it goes. Chet and Hami, can you imagine uh, if either side gets finally gets the ball to start reverse Thanks, swinging just thinking that and then, <laughs> then the ball gets sprayed with hand sanitizer? Unbelievable. I, 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 I mean, can't it's... believe it. Are you going to get basically they've got 15,000 pairs of rubber gloves you get to wear it you get your temperature checked and you got rubber gloves to go in yeah the, I, I agree Chin, I agree I think it probably would have been better for the white ball competition because Jimmy Anderson is the grumpiest man in the world sometimes <laughs> and you give him a ball that starts to reverse swinging you're going to get Indian batsmen thinking right I, how do I get rid of this yeah I think the great story of Verinder Sirwag when he is at Leicester and it was reverse swinging at Leicester and somebody asked him what's the best way to play reverse swing and he just had hit the ball out the park. Not a bad, not a bad, not a bad way to do it. So <laughs> that could happen in the test matches. I was just... might keep the seam, <laughs> might keep the seam a bit better <laughs> after we've seen the last one. But <sighs> yeah, it was horrendous, wasn't it? Chet Narula, enjoy the test match. Thank you so much for your time. It's much appreciated. And Harmy, um, sleep well tonight, big man. And, I will. Uh, we'll... <laughs> There's no doubt about that. See you bright and early Saturday morning. Cheers, manners. <laughs>